Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'd just like to thank you all for coming. I expected after the announcements we made in the plenary, all of us were talking a little bit about what we'd be presenting. And there was that lady speaking about uh, sex and the internet, and I thought, oh, I'm, I'm not going to get anybody coming to this. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Well, so, yeah, let me set the stage first, um, and to really just say something that I think most of us are very much aware of. The population on the continent is really growing. Right now, it stands at 1.2 million people. At the year 2000, it was half that and by 2050 it'll be double again, 2.4 million people. And we already have weak economies, and so the question is, what's going to happen when we have this doubling of the population? Most of the people in 2050 will be really young. Where are the jobs going to be coming from? So what kind of actions should we be taking now to try to assure ourselves of, uh, of a future? Can we make this population growth an opportunity rather than a problem that we're going to have, uh, which is uh, very, very possible? But I believe that it is possible. Uh, currently, the workforce in Kenya, about 85 to 90 percent of the workforce is in the informal sector. So you've only got maximum maybe 15 percent informal jobs, people paying their taxes and so on. The rest really are people who are doing a variety of things. And roughly speaking, about 50 percent of these are in agriculture. They're working on farms in the, rural, in the rural areas. But you know, this is really rapidly changing. Rural urban migration is very, very high on the continent, probably the highest in history, people say. About 30% are in trade, so some of those are selling what is produced at the farms. Some of them are selling imports from China, from India, from various parts of the world. And then about 20% are the artisans, and these are the people who are making things out of uh, metal, out of wood. And this picture is a good uh, illustration of the kinds of conditions and the kinds of uh, technologies that are being implemented to make these things. There is a market. Overall, the um, informal sector is supposed to account for maybe 25% of the GDP. Uh, this obviously needs to grow. The problem is productivity at this level is extremely low. And so if there's any way in which it can be enhanced, it would be important, very important for the economy. So I'd like to give um, a framework for looking at this that's been put together by the World Economic Forum. Uh, we're all aware, and this, uh, this is a constant theme even here in the conference, the fourth industrial revolution is upon us, there's all this technological change, and what you'd expect is in fact that the gap between wealthy nations and poor nations might even widen further, because access to these technologies is, is more difficult in poorer countries. And <clears throat> there is um, this effort at the World Economic Forum uh, that, to look at this question and see maybe if there could be recommendations for government leaders, for business leaders to try to uh, get ready for this fourth industrial revolution so that the disruption that it, it seems to be coming with uh, can be minimized and instead it can really be a benefit to us all. And there's over 30 councils that are looking at the future. And one of them is the Global Council on the Future of Production. And they've come together with a framework for, for, for measuring where every country is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the readiness for the fourth industrial revo revolution. And so what you have here is a structure of production and this is uh, looking at the economic complexity index, so trying to really look at how um, diversified production is in given countries and, 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 and sophisticated it is or not, and then scale. And so this is like a snapshot of what the country is presently or is at where they are presently. And the drivers of production are now the tools that can be used to try to improve the structure. And so you have technology and information, human capital, global trade and investment, institutional framework, sustainable resources, and the demand environment. And so as a policymaker or a, or a businessman, these are some of the things that this analysis is saying that you have at your disposal to try to improve uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the readiness. And all the countries that have been um, assessed using this tool fall under four quadrants. They're those that are leaders, those that have high potential, there's the legacy countries that have invested in certain uh, industrial capacity and so on, which is difficult to just switch around uh, uh, just to catch up with whatever the latest is. And then there's the nascent countries, and most of the dots are in that uh, quadrant, and certainly most of the African countries are in this quadrant over here. And so, um, obviously, as we already know, there's a lot, uh, uh, the challenge is really quite uh, uh, big. Now, there's been real impact from technology, and I think a lot of people look at technology as the, the tool that we can use uh, to try to improve or to, to meet this challenge. In countries like Kenya, you've had mobile money take off, the first country in the world for mobile money to take off uh, using M-Pesa, with the Safaricom uh, product. And uh, building on that, there's a lot of apps that have been developed that give people access to finance, to uh, information, all kinds of things that are very positive for the 
for the uh, economy. And this excitement around tech has led to people setting up tech hubs. So physical spaces where people come in and they're given the support that they require to be able to develop apps and solutions and mostly things relating to fintech and to uh, services and so on. And there is a school of thought that says that really countries in Africa perhaps should not really be thinking about industrializing, that perhaps uh, we're in a post-industrial era right now, let China be the factory of the world and why don't you focus on value addition through services and so on. Uh, but we, uh, especially at Gearbox and a lot of people who are partnering with us believe that isn't really uh, perhaps the correct way to go forward. We think that we should be trying, any country should try to produce a good proportion of whatever they consume and that means physical goods. So we set up a hub, unlike most of the ones that are represented in the map here, which focus on software, ours focuses on hardware. And the whole idea is to try to give access to people who can make things, to tools and to methods, uh, how to design and so on, and how to use those uh, fairly modern tools uh, to be able to make what it is that they're thinking about. So I spent many years teaching at the University of Nairobi. I was teaching in engineering. And I'd see students have, uh, have these very interesting products or other designs and uh, ideas that really didn't go very far beyond being ideas. They'd write up a report and it'd be put on the database. And the system in terms, if you can call it a national innovation system, the government is pouring money into the education for these guys studying engineering and so on. And whatever they're doing, many of them actually are doing their CPAs as they're doing, uh, you know, preparing to be accountants because they're trying to hedge their bets. Many of them end up being hired by the likes of KPMG and Pricewaterhouse. So if you're a policymaker saying, look, in Kenya, for example, we're saying we want to develop our country on industrialization. The people who are really supposed to be doing this in, from the point of view of engineering and value add in terms of engineering, <clears throat> of course, there's many other people who come into play. But that kind of person isn't really able to step in to a job or into being able to use that that they've been trained, that the government taxpayer money has been used on them to be able to develop what we'd like to see happen. And so uh, that I try to build this center for this linkage between industry and university at the university, faced a lot of problems based around uh, bureaucracy. It was very difficult to get things done at the pace we'd have liked to see it done. And so I, I partnered with people at a, a center called IHUB. IHUB is quite famous in Kenya. They were able to get the seed funding for Gearbox, and we set Gearbox up. And what we thought was what we'd do is we'll our core function would be provide, to provide access, as I said before, to these machines and knowledge on how to use the machines. And the basis of this is a, a model like a gym. You pay your membership and you come in. $100 a month roughly, and you can come in every single day. $40 a month, you can come in two days a week, that sort of thing. And uh, you know, we, we found that this was really quite uh, interesting at first. But then the numbers uh, started to dwindle after a while. And so we thought we'd set up Gearbox Academy and train people on how to best use the equipment, but also before using the equipment, how to design, design thinking, user-centered design, how to think about a product before you go and make it. Very often, the students would be making something that sounded very challenging, something that intellectually is something stimulating for them. But quite often, the market doesn't care about those, some of those things. You need to be able to go to the market and understand what people want and then begin. So we, we go through this sequence of, of, uh, of, of su subjects that we train, and so that the likelihood that people come out with something that the market wants is, is, uh, is, is, is increased. <clears throat> um, we also have people who aren't really interested in coming in to make anything themselves and they can contract us and because our staff is really quite lean, uh, we have a database of people who are good designers and so on we can call upon and say can you design this on behalf of whoever it is and, uh, and then make it for them. And so some we do ourselves, some we do through people who use our equipment and then we are always trying to see, to put our finger on the pulse of what's happening. And so research is also an important component of what we do. And we're situated in the industrial area in Nairobi. Um, we've raised about four, four and a half million dollars so far. This is since 2014. So we've been able to get some fairly decent equipment and so on. And uh, we, are, we are basically at a point now where we're, we're really um, sort of supporting some of the guys like these are engineering students from the University of Nairobi who um, are making robots as, a, as an exercise to be able to learn more about robotics. Uh, this is uh, 
some guys who graduated from uh, University of Nairobi and they, they make 3D printers and sell them. They have a company called Africa Born 3D Printing. And what you can see here is a microscope. And this is a really a good demonstration of some of the things that are changing in the world today. It's an open source design, designed at Cambridge University in the U UK. And uh, they were able to download the file free of charge and print it. The, 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 the lens itself is actually a metal, normal lens with a, with a you know, special glass for the lens itself. And at the bottom you have um, a USB camera. And so they were able to, to build these and sell them to vets and so on and so forth. So this is some of the stuff that's being enabled at our center. Uh, using 3D printing, uh, others were able to make these kinds of products that are used in the health industry. So this is a small clinic in a poor part of the city of Nairobi and where these sorts of things break and so on and can easily be designed and printed economically to make business sense. Uh, there's also lots of equipment uh, in a lot of the clinics and hospitals and so on that break down just because maybe a little bit of plastic is broken and you can't find a replacement and so it ends up just sitting and collecting dust and so we found through this pilot that actually 3D printing can be applied uh, to, to meeting needs such as these um, that I'm demonstrating here. These are people who created a, um, a, a wireless network uh, for uh, communication so that people can get a signal. This, this um, sitting over here is a radio and it's able to put, put, uh, power the signal into the parabolic dish and reflect it off up to 10 kilometers. Wherever it's received, you can create a, 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 a LAN, or, and then you can bounce it off from there another 10 kilometers and make a, a, a wireless network quite inexpensively. It's an idea that came out of MIT. We set up a fab lab at the University of Nairobi prior to Gearbox, and we were able to have interaction with MIT students, and uh, the consequence was, this is one of the consequences of that particular pro pro project. We also are, are very from, um, uh, aware that a lot of the, the kinds of things that are need to be able to be done now involve electronics. You need uh, some embedded systems inside of products, and we're looking at things like Internet of Things um, providing new types of business models. You might have heard of uh, B-Box, um, MCOPA, and various kinds of uh, companies that are producing products that they're selling to people through uh, pay-as-you-go type of uh, um, business model. So. You, you, you look and you find that people are not really able to afford, let's say, $30 a month, a poor person, but they can afford a dollar a day. It's how that budget, the money is budgeted over the month, same amount of money. And so if you, if you make it possible for them to pay, say, for solar equipment for the home, uh, every day they just pay a dollar. And uh, they pay it using mobile, mobile, mobile money. So they, everybody has a mobile phone pretty much. And so once they pay it, the server receives their payment and sends a signal to the equipment that they have in their home to switch on. So if you don't pay on a given day, you don't have power. And uh, you can also track the equipment and you know, try to prevent risk of, of theft and so on. And so these kinds of technologies are taking off. And we found like in Kenya, there's over 600,000 customers who now have solar. And solar has been a promising technology since the 70s. But because of how much it costs to actually buy the equipment uh, at one off, it's cheaper in the long run, but not in the beginning. So many people aren't able to afford it. But this way, pay as you go means people can actually afford the equipment. So this equipment here <coughs> is it's a small scale pick and place robot. So what it's doing is picking components and placing them on uh, the, the circuit that's been designed by uh, some of our members. In this case, it's a circuit that is to provide the same pay as you go type of functionality for solar water pumps. And so Douglas, a next student of mine, is a contract engineer. He was asked by a company to design this. That company would normally have gone to China and, and asked, you know, gotten a, a small company. There's only, only 50 of them for a pilot. And, and only small companies would have given them the time of day uh, because the big companies wouldn't really be interested in small orders unless there was a promise of a big order in the future. And so you end up getting companies, something that we go through a lot, you get companies that uh, are small, they're not very good, your 50 boxes come, 20 of them don't work, communication is difficult and so on. So being able to do it in country is really quite significant to the process of developing products. And that's what we've been able to demonstrate. The entire box was made at uh, Gearbox. And making a professional looking and functioning prototype is important because what happens next, all these guys who've been trained are able to, they have an idea, they're able to go out and test it. And what's much easier with software is you can develop your product, whatever it may be, and test it in the market and then show an investor this is what the market says about what I 
uh, I'm thinking about, but with hardware, it's more difficult. And so really our purpose is to make that prototyping possible and then get it out there, do a pilot. They did 50 farmers and found out what was wrong with it, came back, made another 50 and went out. And now they have investment uh, and they're, they're actually taking off with this particular product. So after about two years, the farmer owns, owns a solar water pump. <clears throat> Here is um, another idea that shows what's possible. So a national innovation system in any country, which is pretty much what we're talking about, should make it quite possible for whatever's happening at the universities, research-wise, to diffuse into the marketplace. Uh, this was uh, a, pro a, pro a product that was um, uh, an idea of a professor, and he got a student interested in m combining a roof tile with a solar cell. And so you have just one piece. And uh, he did it for his master's, and when he finished, he started a company. And uh, this is a, a, one of the uh, fittings that they're doing for development. Uh, I don't know exactly how many houses, but their model says you, whatever you're, you as a contractor or the developer, you have a certain cost for your roofing without solar. They said, I'll, char I'll charge you the same amount for your roofing without the solar, but what you must do in return is give me, whoever lives in that house has to be my customer. And they'll pay a third of what they'd be paying for power from the utility. And uh, uh, whatever excess that they're able to store, they can sell back to the utility. And so they, they've got electronics in it so they can monitor the usage and so on and the billing and everything. And uh, this has taken off. And uh, we had a visit from Mark Zuckerberg and I was very proud to be able to share this with him. And Elon Musk, developed the same product in the US. Now, as far as we know, we had a patent in East Africa alone. His patent came after ours. If we had patented globally, then maybe he'd be paying us royalties. But it goes to show that good ideas can come from, from Africa for sure. We know this and we're, we're proving it. So back to the uh, informal sector. And in this video here, it's just giving you a sense of what that uh, environment looks and sounds like. It's a really very interesting place. And we have now been engaged by a local bank. It's the Kenya Commercial Bank Foundation, actually, in Kenya, who do a lot of training. They have a program that's fairly well known in the country. And they're trying to de-risk people like this for loans. So they're saying, can you train them on equipment that can help them to up their productivity? And then we'll give them asset finance, loans to buy the machines that you're training them on and so that their productivity can go up. And so we, we're currently doing that. We've just done 250 people, and we're trying to manage this process as carefully as possible because as history of technology tells you, as soon as you bring a plasma cutter into a space like this, for example, immediate effect is loss of jobs. And, and they also know it, and they've, you know, we've shown them machines, and they're not very happy about what we're coming to do. But the business people amongst them are, of course, very excited. So we're trying to curate the process and make sure that because there'll be more business, the people who lose their jobs doing all these very heavy and physical and crude uh, types of uh, processes will get other jobs uh, further downstream, perhaps. And um, this is a product of uh, one of the engineers who is a member of Gearbox. Uh, he's designed a, a, a plasma cutter. It's, it's his product. And he used to be the head of engineering at Gearbox. And he's now set up his own company, and he's selling these in Nairobi. There's a couple of companies, some of you who are familiar with Nairobi, Rob's Magic, Metal Equipment, they've bought his product, and they're doing uh, his product is doing as well as the, what they used to import, like from the US and so on. So we're really proud that the quality can be up there, the cost is comparable, and what's really special is that you have after-sales service available locally. And this is important for a lot of the people buying the machines. This is a router that does pretty much the same. So these are CNC, the computer numerical control. You do the design on the computer and send it to the machine, and that way you get productivity, you get re repeatability, and so on. <clears throat> And now what we're doing for this particular project with the bank is that we've set up containers to be able to go into the areas where these people work. These, uh, this is an informal sector because you, they would, do not have the luxury to travel even a couple of miles or, or more to be able to come into a center and spend hours learning because they live hand to mouth every day. They must make some money to, to, to live to the next day. And so we go in there, we have um, a workshop at the bottom and a classroom on the top. So some of the guys can be taught CAD and, uh, and others will be taught how to operate the machines. We've got um, the machines like the ones that I've described. We've also got welding equipment and so on. We've got the power tools as well. And um, uh, we're, we're basically uh, going out there doing training for about, we start the training with uh, life skills 
and we look at values, we look at how people uh, relate with one another from a business perspective in particular. We also use South Korea as an example and say, look, this is what South Korea has done. In the 60s, they were poorer than us, and now look at where they are. What did they do that we should be looking to do ourselves? And then we have very, very uh, sort of heated uh, debates and, and discussions, and it's really very exciting. Then we go into human-centered design, and then we go into the technical uh, training itself. So the idea really is to duplicate this and to put these kinds of centers all over the country. Um, this is the lower part of Kenya is, um, is arable land, semi-arid in the top two-thirds. Uh, the fiber the government has laid is now reaching out into the north of the country. So we're proposing putting up centers of different sizes uh, to be able to meet the needs of people so that they're able locally to design things that they need and see whether whatever they need can be made locally. And we're also trying to carry or to ride on the back of government projects. So the government right now is doing an affordable housing project. They plan to put up 500,000 units, uh, housing units uh, in the country over the next few years. And so in that, policy, in, in that whole project, there's a policy that says that there must be 40% local content. Of course, very important uh, to grow local industry. But what's missing from that is a place for the micro businesses like the ones I showed you. And so we're going to the government and saying, look, what we'd like to be able to do is to sign up some of these guys to make your window frames, to make hinges, to make whatever's possible. And so they said to us, well, we can't sign on you know, hundreds or even thousands of these very micro businesses. Why don't you serve as an aggregator? And so currently we're trying to see whether we can actually do that, represent these guys. We're having to, uh, to convince them to take us on as their aggregator buy raw materials in bulk because that way they can take advantage of better pricing and that way their products will be more affordable and uh, see whether we can bring and introduce technologies that can enable them to meet the specs required by the contractors. The difficulty here, of course, the, contract, the government hasn't, hasn't got the money to put up the housing I'm talking about, so the contractors have to come in with their own fi financing and so uh, uh, um, making them uh, stick to the rule of the local content is difficult because they have their own funding. But that's something that is being negotiated currently. And in fact, um, in just a couple of months, the first pro project is starting. So we're really busy right now, starting with window frames in particular, and then moving on to other products uh, in the near future. <clears throat> I think uh, there was a couple more. Ah, okay. So we have... Um, we're also trying to introduce new types of, of products. We're looking at plastics as well. And so there's a roto molder that one of our members has built. And we'd like, again, to introduce roto molding into the uh, informal sector space uh, for making tanks and so on. And, th and these kinds of tanks and products that can be used for farming, for hydroponics, for example, are things that we're looking at. So trying to drive this in terms of what's the best kind of product to put into place so that it has the highest chances of success is what we're doing. We're also very interested in the, the future generations. And so here we have a young student, he's 15 years old, and he's being taught how to disassemble and reassemble a 3D printer. And um, this is uh, some electronics kits that students are being uh, taught how to use to have many little robots that they can, you know, their, their interest in engineering can be picked this way. Of course, this happens all around the world. And doing this locally, I, we believe, is extremely important for the next generation to be interested. We also are looking very much at culture. And this is a particular slide uh, of um, research that's being done at the Rennesala uh, Polytechnic Institute in, in uh, the U.S. by a researcher called Ron Iglash. And he's looking at the fractals in African architecture and in baskets and in hair, uh, hair, hairdos and so on. Very interesting. And we believe that there's, this is just one example of many in terms of uh, specific African cultures, African um, uh, practices. There's one in the western part of Kenya where you have op open head surgery that used to be done uh, successfully and there's videos of it and it looks very crude but has quite a bit of success. And the idea is really just to say let, let's look at who we are, let's look at um, what we've done, have done historically and try to see if we can recreate ourselves. Let's, let's look for a basis really for our own innovation coming forward. So that, the, yes, it's very important uh, to be able to copy stuff that's being done out there because you need to be able to put something in the marketplace that you know there's a market for. But at the same time, trying to encourage people to look back at culture, we find is really important. <clears throat> as well as that, there's different aspects to this. The whole purpose of uh, the industrialization is to increase quality of life. And, and we're really questioning um, what it is about our past that we should perhaps uh, change and what it is that we should keep. 
And the thing is that when you get the Western model of, uh, of development, it comes with more than just uh, the technology and so on. And so people have to be able to look very closely at what it is that's important in terms of relationships and so on. So we're questioning, does the Western culture uh, which is dominant in the world right now, does it represent the pinnacle of human achievement over history? And we believe that it does in terms of technology, it does in terms of economic development very likely, but not necessarily in terms of relationships, in terms of society and community relationships and so on. And we believe that there's a lot of very rich aspects of culture that exist on our, the African continent that need to be enhanced and encouraged. And uh, so that development isn't really just narrowly defined by technological and economic development, but it is social and so on. So there's an argument to be, to be made that African countries are technologically and economically developing, but socially deteriorating. Uh, because uh, people care less about the aged, care less about family as we pro progress in terms of uh, the modernity. And so this, we believe, cannot be divorced from what we're doing. We think that it's part and parcel and we should always be looking with these people who are in our space, who tend to be leaders uh, at who we are and why we do what we do. So that's really uh, the extent of the presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. So uh, we're going to go to a Q&A, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to, to think of some questions. And I know some of you in the audience, so I might call on you uh, for questions. Uh, I'll start off uh, with, uh, with a question. So uh, Steve Jobs created the iPad, and he built a market for himself. Uh, M-Pesa, I think, uh, you know, has done a phenomenal job of being the first mobile banking. They saw a problem, and they created. Your company's job is essentially facilitating the vision of uh, Kenyan entrepreneurs that want to do things. Where do you see the opportunity, perhaps in Kenya that might go elsewhere, that would be the next big thing? Where are you pushing your students, your followers, to focus on in terms of new manufacturing ideas and co concepts? I definitely wouldn't call them followers, but yeah, I get your point. Uh, yeah, so we're looking very much at some of the things that we've already seen work. So I gave examples like this pay-as-you-go system. What you require for that is uh, the circuit, the, 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 the programming of the circuits that are on the chips and so on. And we think that this is not something that exists in the world. So quite often when China, say for example, is um, considered the, mani the, the, the manufacturing center of the world, it's for generic goods. So when you write, call up a factory in China and say, I need a system that's going to be able to work for pay as you go and what, it's not something that they're just gonna pick off the shelf and they have to design it and so on. So we believe there's a niche there. We can, we can design, again, this whole de idea of design thinking. We can design products that we need that are unique to our own situation. We've got, for example, uh, um, a, a, a building Melinda Gates Foundation funded project to design equipment for maternity and newborn child health. And so we were very involved, University of Nairobi Gearbox, and we designed a couple of machines. And when we're looking, when we go in and do the human-centered design, we say, well, here's an incubator from Germany. It's really, really good. It really works well in a, a certain kind of a, a hospital. In the corridors at Kenyatta National Hospital in Nairobi, there are potholes in the corridor. So, you know, if you have little uh, wheels, the caster wheels, you know, it's going to get knocked and maybe a little broken. There's power fluctuations, there's dust. So you have to take into account these things and design for the local situation. So we believe that approach generally will pro produce uh, those things that become the next big thing because we hopefully will be able to be manufacturing locally. What I showed you in terms of the pick and place machine, the electronic circuitry, we are now trying to raise funds to set up a, a line that can be contracted so that we can now export this technology to other countries. So some of the guys at Gearbox are designing uh, uh, automobile tracking um, uh, circuitry uh, that is also um, uh, circuitry that can be used uh, for speed governance, which is a law in, that's been put into place in Kenya and other countries. So now they're selling, those who are selling in, designing for Kenya and selling in Kenya are selling in Nigeria, are selling in Uganda. So we're starting to see the signs of a possible uh, uh, situation where Kenya is now providing these products for other countries as well. Uh, so this is the kind of approach that we're taking towards that. Thank you. The floor is open for questions. You can go there or I can give you the mic. Good morning, Max Brickle from uh, Rhode Island, the USA. Uh, a number of uh, friends and myself, we do a lot of manufacturing in China and India, uh, but those locations, specifically China, are not conducive to future manufacturing because they're not cost effective anymore. So they've moved production to Vietnam, Bangladesh, areas like that. And I think 
Africa, specifically Kenya, would be a location that folks could relocate manufacturing, but you need political stability, you need infrastructure, you need an educated workforce, and this would be industrial manufacturing jobs like textiles, and that's an industry that we're in. So if, if the base platform in Kenya could offer those things, people would have confidence to move production there because they are looking toward the future of where they're going to produce their goods. And as you said, the population is going to double in a very short period of time. So the opportunity is going to be there, but they have to have those base elements in place in order for people to have the confidence to move there. Absolutely. So, I mean, we, we've had people from China coming in, giving us that same kind of story and saying, look, uh, Shenzhen, for example, has been way too successful. It means now that for like, I think, two kilometers, uh, uh, diameter out is too expensive for workers to live and so on. So they're pushing this out and they're asking because especially if you look at the population growth in Africa as potential market in the future, can we move to Africa? Can we come into, uh, Ethiopia has been quite popular because they've got a lot of what you said in terms of policies being set up right and so on. Controlled economy but uh, doing many of the right things uh, and so therefore they have I think the highest growth rate probably in the world right now economic growth rate and so you know we, we would love to push that to happen uh, in Kenya and we are engaging government all the time trying to push the lobby for some of the things that you're talking about to be put in place and so what we suffer from a lot as well is fragmentation so many of our countries have small markets and so on if people come in they need to be kind of assured look we've got to have um, a certain scale and scalability and so when you move from Kenya to Tanzania, some of the rules change in terms of you know, business operation and so on. Laws are different, maybe some cultural aspects are different. So the, 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 the um, uh, Africa-wide trade agreement that is, was signed recently is a good step in the direction now of creating more uniformity. And we um, really hope more of that will happen for sure. But you're right, I agree with you. Sorry, please do use the mic because this session is being recorded in case uh, so we can hear you. Th thank you for coming. Uh, my, my question was kind of building off of that is wh where do you see Kenya in this uh, process coming towards, um, towards more stability and, the, and workforce? Uh, what do you see, where do you see Kenya in, the, um, in that process? What are the uh, big successes and what are the areas to focus on? So in terms of vision, we definitely want to build a model that can work anywhere in Africa. So we're looking to see whether what we're doing now can move, you know, this interest that the banks have in reaching those people who they don't normally loan to by de-risking them in the way that we are, we believe can happen across the continent. However, to answer you directly, uh, Kenya uh, has gone through a lot of maturing in terms of p political process. It doesn't always look like that, but if you, re if you were aware in the last election, after the results were announced, the Chief Justice uh, cancelled, annulled the election, and you know it was accepted by both uh, the contenders. And so that doesn't normally happen in countries like ours. And so there's a maturing process that's been taking place. And right now, there is um, a, a sort of an understanding between both of the main parties that we can't afford to be on the brink of war at the next election. So there's, they're trying to change the constitution to have a more sort of a sharing type of formula so that it's not winner takes all uh, uh, in terms of the outcome of who becomes a president. And so, so long as those sorts of things continue to grow in the manner that they are, I see Kenya really moving uh, forward in, in, a, in a very significant way. There's a lot going for Kenya, especially in terms of human resource training and so on. And so we, we, we really just, need the government to be the facilitator it should be and that I think is happening uh, not very not as fast as we'd like to see it happen but I think a lot of things are uh, sort of the signs are in the right direction so far sure Here. <coughs> um, as an alternative to uh, the need for aggregation to supply large volumes wouldn't blockchain be a good way to connect these uh, small manufacturers with small buyers across the world have you guys uh, played with the blockchain idea? Yeah, that, that, that's a good idea. I, I mean, a, a, an interesting thought. I, I haven't not looked at it from that perspective, no, and I certainly will follow that up. But uh, blockchain is something that's quite popular in, in Kenya. Quite a few people, are, like we're number 22 or something in the world in terms of usage of cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And we are, the government has set up a commission right now to look at blockchain in particular for uh, title deeds and for bringing more transparency into govern, government transactions, which is a great thing. Uh, but this particular one, I wonder, because uh, 
you're saying that by using a blockchain, you can source uh, materials that, I mean, raw materials. So like if I'm a micro industry and I'm trying to make 100 window frames only, uh, that I can be able to buy just that amount of material more cheaply just because of blockchain? I don't see that. Yeah. Oh, he has yeah. another mic. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is um, <laughs> what blockchain provides is trust, traceability, and automation of a transaction. Right. If I am a small buyer that only need to buy five, I don't know, hard disk or circuits, <laughs> as the, the example you show, and the producer may be in Kenya, blockchain may be the way to connect somebody in Colombia with somebody in Kenya just for five or 10 or 15 <laughs> units. So is it opposite to trying to move large volumes of manufacturing from large industrialized uh, countries into developing countries is more connecting the small producer with the small buyer of goods and services. Yeah, I think anything that can make that happen so that you're getting your your raw materials more cheaply would be a great, uh, a great, great thing for sure. So I, I don't fully understand, but I, I, I certainly worth looking into. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Good. Uh Good afternoon. <laughs> to Good check afternoon. my watch. Um, Alex from YPO Johannesburg. Could you maybe just give us a bit more color or context to where manufacturing is in Kenya? So you've given a great presentation in terms of grassroots and what you're doing to develop the interest within engineering and manufacturing. Um, we're a manufacturer here. We're looking at manufacturing further up on the continent um, in terms of the petrochemical industry and in the fruit juice concentrate industry. And there just isn't a degree of comfort to actually move capital equipment and production further up the, the continent. And then also, secondly, just give us some, some of the industries within Nairobi and Kenya that actually require uh, scaled manufacturing rather than our, you know, micro manufacturing. Micro. Mm. Yeah, so uh, Kenya, Currently, uh, manufacturing as a sector is uh, responsible for about eight to nine percent of the GDP, and that's been that's dropped. It used to be at about 12, 13 percent, and so it's shrinking in a sense. And there's many reasons for that. And I, you know, I, I'm not an economist, but I know that uh, there are certain things that have been happening, for, at especially at government level, and just um, changes in the situation regionally and so on that mean that the, the dominance that we had in the region is no longer the case, and so there's been a shrinkage. However, um, <clears throat> we, we're looking at uh, agro-based uh, uh, industries, so there's lots of like edible oils and so on, uh, and f other food products. Uh, we've got uh, petrochemical is, is, is really very small. We have a refinery, but that has had problems, so it's not really uh, functioning right now, but there, there, is a, there is a plan for that. There's steel, that is tertiary processing of steel, so we import the coils and then we convert those into various building materials. We're in that sector as well. So I see, yeah. So there's about, I think, 25 or so companies in Kenya that uh, deal with that tertiary processing. And there's a plan the government has now for a steel plant, which uh, should be happening maybe in the next three years, I don't know. But uh, it's to set up a st an integrated steel plant. So you're actually processing the, the iron ore into pig iron and then pig iron into steels. And so th that's, uh, that's something that's in the works. Um, so we have a, a fairly diversified manufacturing base. There's lots of the tea industry is probably the biggest uh, in terms of processing tea for export, and it's, it is a huge export for the country. There's horticulture as well uh, that does require some processing uh, for sure. Uh, so there is it's fairly fairly diversified for a country like ours, uh, but certainly it's suffering a little bit right now. We're looking at automotive right now, so there's a lot of uh, lobbying from uh, the, the, the manufacturing sector to government to change the laws to favor manufacturing locally. So for example, uh, there are certain products that you can import like computers uh, and they're zero rated in terms of tax. But then if you make the components, so you're trying to put together a computer, you'll be taxed for those components. So trying to sort of look at those details, uh, those people who assemble uh, vehicles in the country uh, versus those who are trying to, uh, they're importing, the, the, there's a lot of things that are being looked at. There's a lot of lobbying going, going on right now to favor local industry. But as far as I know, um, FDI has continued to be very interested, interesting in Kenya, growing. There's lots of companies that have relocated their headquarters from other parts of the continent to Kenya, uh, looking at where the future looks like it's going for, because our position geographically is quite uh, important. And also, uh, politically, we seem to be, as I said earlier, um, uh, developing in very good ways. So I think um, 
it's, it's not a bad time to invest, but I, of course you talk to an invest, to an economist to get a, a very accurate uh, picture. Yeah. And then probably people in the room who, who can also add to that. Yeah. James, maybe. <laughs> Before I ask the last question, yes, more questions there. Thank you. And thanks for the amazing work you're doing. I think it's uh, really commendable. Thank you. Um, uh, the question is, do you have any active discussion going on with the Ministry of Education uh, in Kenya? Uh, and maybe another way of asking that is if you had dinner with the Minister of Education, what would you ask him? Um, and how do you think we can better prepare youth for this uh, new world that's coming? Yeah, that's Thank a very you. good question. So yeah, education is at the base of it. So um, if, if that isn't right, then you basically just don't get the right kinds of people coming out of the system. And we've had, excuse me, we've had a, a changes in our system of education. Uh, when, when I was in high school, we had uh, seven years in primary school, four years uh, to O levels, two years to A levels, a British system, and then three years in university roughly. And then that was changed to an 844 system, which was imposed by the World Bank. And uh, it was not just Kenya, a number of countries. And uh, that has recently been changed. So we're looking now at a system which is competence-based, uh, uh, so, so that people have to demonstrate to get to the next level competence in certain areas. And it, it looks fairly good, actually, on paper, uh, whether the resources are there to really do it the right way, to train the teachers to be able to switch the way they teach and so on is, is a challenge. But uh, there is a lot of discussion and activity around trying to improve the education system. From the point of view of what we're doing and tertiary education, uh, one thing that um, maybe didn't come out as strongly as I sh should have uh, maybe emphasized it a little bit more, when we have engineers coming into the space, <clears throat> that's uh, perhaps a more obvious kind of person coming in to be able to use the fundamentals that they've learned in engineering to make products. But then there's another class of people who haven't got that background, who can be trained. They can have very little education, like the artisans in the pictures there. They could be medical doctors. But they, want, they have a talent, a natural talent to, to make things, or they want to make things. And they can be enabled to make products uh, through some high-level kind of design and, 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 and implementation. So by that, I mean they don't go very deep. They're sort of skimming on the surface of certain types of technologies. And to be able to provide access for those sorts of people who we call makers, um, once they are able to use those tools, they, they then are called makers, uh, would be very important for countries like ours because we have a lo much larger number of those kinds of people than the educated engineers. And so uh, it's something that we'd like to see happen more, to have that facilitation. So kind of disrupt the education system so that you can go and take short courses like the ones we offer. We offer like 20 contact hours, and you can keep building on that in a modular way or very, very hands-on. Uh, with a guru in the lab to help you around, uh, you know, sort of make sure that you, you understand what you're doing. And then it's uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and then expert level. And so we, we, we bring in resources from in, within the country in blockchain, in AI and, and machine learning, in uh, um, virtual reality and augmented reality. We also, much of our funding comes from North America, so Lemelson Foundation and Autodesk, the people who produce most of the computer-aided design software, they give us free licenses for their software and also opportunity to go into uh, the U.S. And, and, and be exposed to what's happening and also have people come from outside into the country to support this system. So these are the kinds of things I think we should see more of. And then this whole idea about interface between the universities and the colleges and industry is something that hasn't been done well so far because the assumption is that you're a, a professor and so on, then you're given the responsibility to run this center and you know next to nothing about how to run a center from a business perspective and so on, and it doesn't work and everyone wonders why. And so like we went to Israel with the vice chancellor uh, at the University of Nairobi and there the universities give it to somebody who understands business, they still own it, but that person doesn't need to keep asking for permission for procurement. So they, they, they skirt around, they ring fence that unit away from all the bureaucracy so that it can operate in a nimble manner. And that kind of thing would be very, very important so that we're creating solutions that are directly relevant to um, our own situation. Uh, so those are some of the things certainly that I would, be, I would recommend. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Nicolas Besson, Captain Wylands. If my dream is to build the biggest dairy plant in Kenya to supply East Africa with uh, dairy products, what would your advice be? 
Uh, frankly, <laughs> James is laughing because he knows my answer. I'll say, don't, don't, don't try Kenya. <laughs> and, but that's just a joke. It's just because the, the first family in Kenya, the president's family, is the biggest owner of dairy in the country. So you, you, you'd have a difficult time. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point, yeah. Maybe you have what it takes. So, yeah, so I think, I mean, the market certainly is there. And uh, you know that's why they're in it, and uh, it's it's growing uh, as uh, it, you know as people's disposable income increases and so on. Uh, the grade of the cattle is being uh, improved all the time because a lot of local farmers are, are switched on to what they need to do, and when they can raise enough money or get a loan, they they get uh, uh, this uh, I can't remember the name where you get the, the 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 implants, the implants into their cows to get the better grade and so on and so forth. Uh, what I mean is implanted embryos, embryo implant. That's what I mean. And so, you know, there is, I think, a good opportunity there. But, um, uh, and the, the, the industry in terms of technologically, the dairy industry that's there is, is fairly efficient uh, from, from my perspective as a lay perspective. So you'd need to speak to an expert to get a real proper answer, but that's what I can say. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go back to um, some of the earlier things that you said that I'm interested in. I saw that you were talking about how college students and you know the head of engineering and all these people would be coming in to do the uh, gearbox um, uh, initiatives. Uh, but I also saw the picture of the security guards that you had built in. And I wanted to know a little bit more about that, um, just to see if this works. How, how does it work? How um, Out of how many people that you start training on AutoCAD or who are maybe high school uh, grads um, actually uh, go on to create their own business or do something with their lives. Um, how difficult is it? And have you, uh, has anybody taken this idea uh, somewhere outside of uh, maybe Southern Africa, maybe Northern Africa or um, Asia? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so currently there's about 35 or so companies associated with Gearbox that have come out of ideas that were started there and, and, and uh, they're, you know, many of them are at a very, very early stage of their development. The, there is an environment, part of the environment is competitions and hackathons and that sort of thing. And so we uh, partner with, <clears throat> for example, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers on an Africa-wide uh, competition. And so whoever wins it has access to Gearbox. And the same with the Royal Academy of Engineering from the UK. They also have a competition that we partner with them on. And so you find that uh, these competitions tend to be quite good for getting uh, new ideas through and so on. Uh, besides, just, a lot of the people who hang around will apply for the competitions to, to get the seed funding, because seed funding, of course, is the highest risk type of funding. And so the, 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 the finance uh, or the investment environment around these co sorts of ideas hasn't developed as much as we'd like to see it, especially where local investors are concerned. So there's quite a bit of money coming from outside. It's competition money, $50,000, $100,000, which is not bad. Uh, and so you'll find quite a, bit of, quite a few of the companies start out that way. Uh, then the system is also maturing to the point where, like now, with the pay-as-you-go uh, type of um, technology I described earlier, there's something like 25 companies in Kenya which, is, which are supplying pay-as-you-go solar power for the home. And uh, the reason there's so many is that most of them are being kept alive by free money from foundations and so on. So sometimes that free money skews the marketplace in ways that are negative, and that has to be something that's checked as well. But uh, overall, um, the, the, the throughput in terms of c people coming into train and then getting an idea out, it's, it's not as high as we'd like it to be, but with, our, with the Gearbox Academy, which we're just done with the pilot, and now we're going to go into the sort of the next phase, we expect that every graduate will only graduate when they have a product. So remember I said that when you come in, the first thing you do is human-centered design. And so you have to go out there and design something that people need. And then you have to make it, and then you graduate. So so long as it's something that's affordable, because you have to pay for it from you, for yourself. So some of them are engineers, and others are uh, the, the ones who will become makers. So some of them could have very little education, but many of them will have uh, some education, but just not in engineering. And so we got somebody who maybe would have loved to have done engineering, but the admission requirements favor only a certain kind of engineering mind that is strong in, in mathematics and physics. But there's people who may not be able really to 
write down all the formulas, but they're really good at engineering. They can make things, in other words, and those people get left out. And so we believe that we can offer them also a way to have uh, an education which formalizes their, their skills and gives them skills that may not be the same as the engineer, but are still very useful to the economy. So those kinds of people are also very welcome. And there are many more of those people, as I was saying earlier, than the ones who have the benefit of doing an engineering degree. So uh, they're the people who repair cars, repair your electrical appliances, and, and so on and so forth. And, yeah. Great. Um, so at the, you know, borrowing from the lesson we had in storytelling a little bit, uh, and uh, as a fellow Kenyan, um, sitting where you're sitting right now, and maybe this helps with other folks looking at the country, and you know, you may help them draw a picture of where we might be going. You know, you're sitting in Kenya, which is in a region that contains five of the 20th fastest growing economies in the world. It's the fastest growing population segment in the world, uh, probably going to hit about 400 million across all of the different countries, we include Ethiopia, over the next few years, at a time of increasing regional integration, specifically in that region and then more broadly across Africa in a country that was one of the few in the world that's gone digital before it's become industrialized. So you have almost universal digital payments, almost universal digital services, a techno-savvy population. Great, you've got a port, you've got all of this stuff. Sitting where you're sitting now as a, as a pioneer of a different way of thinking about manufacturing beyond the old traditional industries or the Juakali highly informal space, and projecting not to next year, or to four years from now, right? What do you see as where you're trying to get to? Like, what's the natural space for, uh, for what you're trying to build, whether it's a Kenyan vision or an African vision or something in between? I'd love to just hear your reflections building on some of those building blocks that uh, we find ourselves holding at this time in history. Yeah, so the whole picture that um, people would be able to uh, make what they need locally, design and make what they need locally, is really the beginning of our vision. And so we're saying, what is it this, uh, this, that, that needs to be put into place to make this happen in a manner that makes economic sense? So being able to be trained on how to use a, a digital fabrication tool is just one step. The slide that I showed about the, uh, the, 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 the fourth industrial revolution analysis done by the World Economic Forum tells you that there's a lot more that has to be put in place in order for any such model to exist for industrialization. And that really is something that uh, is quite often beyond what we can do, but we're looking at human capital and technological innovation, and these other things need to be put into place as well to make it happen. But we'd love to be able to see at the village level uh, centers like ours, not as big as what we have in Nairobi, but we, we have a formula for figuring out what you should have in a certain place. We're putting one up in a place called Lamu that of course you know and possibly others here know on the coast of Kenya uh, uh, to be able to see. So we, we come and look at what they do. So they do very ornate carvings on doors, they do furniture, they do various kinds of um, uh, jewelry and so on. Let's come in and, and, and make that more Product, productive in terms of the way they make those things, and then introduce new types of tools like the plastics processing and see whether it's possible for micro, com micro companies, really small businesses, to take advantage of those kinds of um, machines uh, economically and, and succeed. So in a sense, democratizing uh, access to becoming uh, a manufacturer. And say, because most of the, ma the, the manufacturers present are those uh, that come in from outside, so the, <clears throat> the uh, big companies, that all they're really doing is manufacturing something that's been designed elsewhere. And we, we as engineers have a lot of frustration saying, well, why don't you change this on your line or so on? And they have to refer back to the headquarters to have any sort of change and, and that kind of thing. And, and to say, well, if we can get more local people able to start, even small industries, and we look at what happened in China, uh, or if you go to countries like India and you walk around in Mumbai or somewhere and you, you know, you'll find in, in a very small, unlikely place they're producing toilet seats or whatever it might be. That's the kind of thing we'd like to see happen and allow it to evolve. Those who are better will do better and so on. And those that are not so good will, you know. So just democratizing access to this sort of thing. So you do need the banks to finance this. And that means you need to de-risk these people um, so that they can get their loans. We're also very interested in the merry-go-rounds where people come into small groups and lend each other money to see whether this can lend itself to uh, another source of, of, of getting money rather than the loans from the banks, which tend to be quite expensive in terms of interest rate and so on. And a lot of the guys we're training have told us we don't want to get a loan. We're scared of it. And maybe the, 
the bank tells us 20% usually of those trained will come back for a loan. And that's somewhere where blockchain is coming in because the organization of those groups, uh, quite a, there's quite a few blockchain applications to help them organize what they do so that it's really transparent and everybody's comfortable with what the treasurer is doing with the money, what the chairman is doing with the money. And so that may be high potential for growth. So yeah, it's empowerment really, in, in a word, uh, for, for manufacturing. I don't know whether that answers you sufficiently. All right, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to ask uh, the last question and bring the meeting to a close. I'm gonna ask you an easy question, but I'm gonna make it difficult for you to answer. <laughs> okay. The easy question is, what has been your passion project that you're most proud of and why? And the difficult part is if you can answer each of those two questions. So what is your passion project and why? Each of those questions, answer in one sentence each, please. <laughs> so, okay. My passion project has been setting up the space that I've set up, which has taken over 10 years to set up. And the reason is that it is a way of unlocking the talent that I see all the time around me in the students and in the population. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Kamal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.